morning. I know that uh, with everything going on in our world, it's been quite a year already, and then uh, politically what's been going on recently has us, a lot of us, very concerned. And uh, I love that we, you know, one of the songs uh, David uh, led this morning, It Is Well With My Soul, that's a song that uh, during the darkest, most challenging time in my life, that song um, brought special meaning to me. And I, uh, you know, I'd sung it and, and praised God with it previous, but when I went through a really, really tough trial is when I latched on to that song, uh, you know, with both hands. It is well with my soul. Uh, even in uncertain and, you know, doubtful and, and difficult and painful times. And so I encourage you to do that. I encourage uh, and remind you we should look different than the world. And when the world panics, those in Christ should not panic. And uh, so I, I want to remind you of a scripture as well, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 says, Keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And I remind you that as long as our Father is on the throne, the sky is not falling. Didn't get any amens. Let me try it again. As long as our Father is on the throne, the sky is not falling. Amen. Amen? Now, when the news report comes that says God is no longer on the throne, the sky would be falling, but we know that won't happen. So uh, God Almighty is still on the throne, and I encourage you to find confidence in that. Uh, and whatever you fear today, it is, not the fir it is not God's first rodeo. It's not the first thing he's ever helped one of his children through. So, uh, turning your Bibles to John chapter 3, this is where uh, I, we're going to dive in this morning, John chapter 3, and I have a, a three-part series planned on this title and this idea of being born again, and uh, Jim mentioned that uh, most of us have, you know, found salvation in Christ and uh, have had the, the blessing of baptism and sins washed away. And so, uh, let's talk about something really, really important this morning. Being born again in Christ. So, John chapter 3, of course, uh, you're familiar with uh, one verse for sure in this chapter, and that's verse 16. But on our way to getting there, verse 1, we read that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So we begin this chapter and we're introduced to a character named Nicodemus. <clears throat> Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Um, and so at first glance, Pharisees, of course, most of them were against Jesus. He would do miracles. They would not deny the miracle. They would deny whose higher power or lower power it came from. They say, well, it must be Satan. That's, a, that's your typical Pharisee in the first century. But Nicodemus was different. He comes to Jesus. He comes at night, uh, maybe because for fear of, of what the rest of the Pharisees, you know, would uh, kind of the judgment they would place on him. But nevertheless, he comes to Jesus at night. <clears throat> he just makes a, an honorable statement that says, he says, we, which means uh, at least many of the Pharisees, but we know that you're a teacher come from God. Jesus answers him and gets straight to the point. Jesus doesn't, you know, the scripture doesn't record this conversation or uh, small talk. Jesus gets straight to the point. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Have you ever uh, been somewhere and you can't go in unless you have something? Maybe, uh, maybe uh, you have to pay, pay you know, $5 to get into a kid's sporting event. 
or maybe you have to have a mask to go into whatever place it is, a hospital. Uh, I barreled on into a funeral home recently, and uh, I was the preacher. I thought I was, you know, kind of essential to what was going on there that day, but without a mask, I was not. And so, uh, and that's fine. I have got one out here somewhere, and so I went and put one on. Um, I've been to a few OU football games, and every time I go, I make sure I have my wallet, but I really make sure I have a ticket to get into that game, right? Because I can do without, a, I can do without a, as long as we have a full tank of gas, I think we can get down there and back. Got to have a ticket to get in the game. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, there's something you have to have to get into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, I remind you, is, is speaking about the church. This is the church. Remember, Jesus said to Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of God. Peter's not at the gate in heaven, by the way. You, there are a lot of jokes that talk about, okay, so here's Peter at the gate, and here's a joke for you. Um, Peter's not at the gate in heaven. There's not a physical gate anyway. Peter unlocked the gate into entrance into the church, the kingdom of God, in Acts chapter 2 when he preached the first gospel sermon. That's Peter giving the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus says, you, you can't, uh, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus, he, he replies, and, and he's confused. How can you be born when you're old? Nicodemus is thinking very literally. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water and the Spirit. So let's, comp let's, take, let's go to Acts chapter 2 and compare this to... What does Scripture say about when the church began and when Peter was uh, talking to that audience in Acts chapter 2? And Peter convicts them of sin. And, of course, their primary sin is they, they were ones that wanted Jesus crucified. But nevertheless, Jesus, uh, Peter says to them that they have killed the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, in John 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, You have to be born of water and the Spirit. Nicodemus is confused. It takes, Jesus has to explain it, has to slow it down for him. But in Acts chapter 2 we see that Peter told people to be baptized and that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The fact is, at salvation, submission to baptism is what, that's our part. Uh, granting the Spirit, the indwelling gift of the Spirit is God's part, but it is being born of water and the Spirit. Okay, let's go back to John chapter 3, verse 6. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. We live in a world of people that are flesh. And we are. And you and, you and I understand, you, you're hungry, let's eat. Right? You're thirsty, let's drink. You understand, you're tired, let's rest. We live in this physical body, but you and I believe in a spiritual life. And we believe that we have a spiritual life and a spiritual birth. And, and Jesus is saying... You have to be, when you're born of flesh, you're flesh, but I'm talking about a spiritual birth, a second birth, a rebirth. Let's look at Romans, flip to Romans chapter 6, a great passage on uh, baptism. It's a great passage on being born again. And, and Paul has been talking about grace and how wonderful it is that now we live in the new covenant of grace. Chapter 6, verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So Paul's made, he's, he's explaining that God's grace is enough. In other words, whatever you've done in your past, let me ask the question, have you ever felt like you've done something that was maybe too bad <clears throat> for God to forgive you? I'm not asking for hands, right? But I know there are some yeses. If, you, if, if your answer to that is yes, I promise you, you're not the only one in this room. If you feel like you've ever done something so bad that God can't, he wouldn't forgive your sin. That's what Paul's been talking about. God's grace is enough. 
But then Paul, he goes to the other side. He says, now hold on. That doesn't mean we can just live that way. It doesn't mean we can just keep sinning and living in sin. And the fact is we, and the point that Paul makes is, hey, we died to that. We died to sin. Uh, at my, uh, we recently uh, sold our house that we've been living in for 12 years, and I'm uh, I'm real good about. Mm, nah, I wouldn't even say that. I'm. Uh, <laughs> hmm. When things break, if it's not essential, it's just going to be broken for a while at my house. But if it's es- if it's semi essential, I'm going to patch it. If you know what I mean. So. There was an area under our soffits, our porch, uh, the soffit there that had uh, rotted, that got a, developed a hole there. I don't know. I, I don't know what all happened. All I know is birds were having a heyday with it, and it and it was kind of falling apart. And so I got me one of those uh, soffit screens that you put so it vents your, uh, lets air travel through your attic and cool it down. And uh, I slapped that up there and screwed that up there, and I patched it. And I thought that was good, and that lasted for a little bit. But then, then I got kind of then there it it this issue of, of rotting wood developed further, spread. So I got another one. I put that up there, <laughs> and uh, I tried a few different things, trying to patch it best I could because I'm not a carpenter. And then finally, we call a carpenter, and the carpenter comes out. He cuts out all the bad part, takes it all out, tears it out, um, puts in new wood. Seals it, we paint it, did it right, okay? Looks good. Your life and my life, <clears throat> when we live it our way, when we handle sin our way, when we, make sense? When we choose to do things our way, because there is an our way. Your way and my way is not pretty, is my point. It's not pretty. Um, it's full of, envy and bitterness, it's full of sass, it's full of anger and hatred, it's full of uh, sin and uh, deceit and greed and covetousness and bitterness and resentment and did I repeat some of those? I don't know, it's ugly. When, when you and I are left to, to handle our spiritual mess, we muck it up. Amen? We make a mess of it. And that's what Paul is saying. You died to that. You tried it your way. It didn't work. You can't find God. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't enter heaven where God is doing it your way. And then read on in Romans, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Um, Point being... When we think of baptism, if you've ever, um, when you hear about someone being baptized, we're excited. When you hear that someone's, you know, they're headed up to the church or they're at the church, they're about to be baptized, you're going to go witness it. Excited uh, because baptism is something we rejoice over because someone is being born again, right? Sins are being washed away. So it's, it's a beautiful, it's a birth, it's wonderful, but baptism is also a death. And in Romans 6, verse 4 says, we were buried. You don't bury living things. You bury dead things. Baptism is a death. And what dies at baptism is our way, our wishes, our desires, the way we want to live, and our sin. And God washes that away. But our way of living, we kill it at baptism. So in our house uh, recently, we found evidence of mice. And if you've ever uh, battled mice, so, which I had before, and I've uh, took, uh, taken care of those little critters before, and so we set out some mouse traps, and I thought, no big deal, mouse traps, they're cheap. I went with my, my go-to is uh, peanut butter, and then also mixed in some cheese, because peanut these mice, they're like some I've encountered before. They, they get to that trap and they lick that thing clean. So they found my peanut butter and they said, thank you very much for serving us today. And they licked that mouse trap clean and the trap is still set 
and the mouse is still is just getting fatter. So, uh, so I went with some cheese. That didn't work. They looked that clean. And uh, then finally we got one. Got one and threw the trap away. Anybody else do that? You throw the whole trap away? Yeah, I know a bunch of y'all save your traps. Uh-uh, not touching that thing. It's all gone. So, uh, but then we saw some more evidence. So we thought, we've got like multiple mice. We have a big issue here. So I went, anyway, so since they're licking clean my traps, I went to Reesers. And would you believe they've improved upon the mouse trap in the last 100 years? <laughs> they have these new, new uh, mice traps where you, they have a door on each end. And you, prop, you open one door. And when they walk through, they, the, their weight trips that door. Anyway, it's awesome. It's a good little trap. So got, I got a few of those, and then I ordered some more on Amazon because I thought, we've got a problem with mice. We're not having this. So I've got these traps set everywhere. I have beef jerky in them. I have uh, peanut butter in them. And they're everywhere. Long story short, which is kind of not the point, but we've not caught any more. Evidently, one fat mouse was wreaking havoc in our house. That's all we have. Here's my point. There are certain things that you and I don't tolerate. We don't want a few mice, we don't want to reduce the mice population if we have an issue in our home, right? We want to extinguish completely. Um, if you've ever had a termite issue, you don't call an, a, a, a termite person and say, hey, could you reduce the amount of termites we have here? We want them all gone. If you've ever dealt with lice, which we have more than once, if you've ever dealt with that, you're not trying to reduce the population. We want them all, we want total, total annihilation. And that's what scripture says about sin. And that's why you and I should look very different from the world. We should be people who have very, very little example of sin in us and that's what baptism is about it's about a death it's about dying to that look at ver read on in Romans 6 so you were baptized you were buried with Christ in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father we too might walk in newness of life so we're, we're it is this is the rebirth this is the born again we're going to walk in newness of life now remember in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again. He uses the word unless. That, that's, this is an important thing. It's a conditional thing. If you don't have this ticket, right, unless you're born again. Paul here in Romans 6 says, if, in verse 5, if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united in a resurrection like his. Um, Certain things need to be out of our life, and that's sin, and that's what God is telling us uh, that he wants to rid us of sin. Now, let's get to, this is really what I want to get into today, is, and to climb, I want to talk about being born again, but I also want to help us understand some things correctly about Scripture. John three sixteen. if you know any Scripture besides Jesus wept, you probably know this one, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This verse is not talking about faith only. Uh, there, there is no scripture and place in scripture where God, um, where God tells us to have faith only. In other words, just believe and then you're good. I mean, you can live how you want. I mean, you, you ought to live godly, but whatever, because you believed. So... This is not saying faith only. And it's not contrasting uh, faith versus works. This verse is talking about those who believe versus those who do not believe at all and reject God. And I'll show you why. Verse flip. Uh, notice two verses later in verse 18. Let's compare this. Verse 18 kind of gives us a deeper understanding of this. Jesus says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but... Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And so this is you either believe or you reject God. You don't believe. Uh, you're in or you're out. So both of them, both of these verses 
16 and 18 mention belief, but 18 goes further and says, here's the point. It's, if you don't believe, then you reject God. So looking further at verse 18, and to put it really, really simply, we're faced with a choice. Our greatest choice in life is not who we're going to cast a vote for in a ballot box. That's not our greatest choice. Our greatest choice is the eternal choice. Am I going to be with God or not? Am I going to be with Christ or not? Am I going to find salvation and walk in that and live a new life or not? And so that's, that's what this whole chapter is about, what Jesus is trying to teach Nicodemus. And then if you go to the very end of the chapter, just to take it even deeper and more clear, very last verse of John chapter 3, do you know what this says? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son. Notice how it's not talking about faith only. That's not the point. This is are you with God or are you not with God? If you're with God, you're obeying God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Um, when uh, Liz was a baby, and I, thought she, I was uh, thinking she was a little younger, but now as I notice this, grandson who's just turned a year old not too long ago she was about that age about a year old had her in a, a Sunday morning uh, church service in Wilberton uh, and I wasn't I was the campus minister so I wasn't preaching so I'm sitting in a, a sermon just like you are today and then I I hear this uh, kind of hear and feel this noise together and the and the way I'd refer to what happened was I I call it a blowout. If you've ever you know what it's like to have a child or grandchild in diapers and they're of a size when they can make a sizable deposit. And <clears throat> so she did in this particular deposit and I was wearing uh, khaki pants to fully paint the picture. Young people that's a lighter colored kind of almost a white pant. Uh, I'm wearing khaki pants, and she may, and she's in a little frilly dress with uh, bloomers, you know, bloomers that go over the diaper, and she makes a deposit into that diaper, and the diaper is not enough. It's not enough, and neither were the bloomers. And so I pick her up, and I go to the back, and I make a split-second decision. We're going home. <laughs> we're going home because... This has got to change. This has got to be changed, right? And so my, uh, the thing I want to give you to take away today is sin is something you and I struggle with because a part of us likes sin. We like to handle things our way. We like to go about life our way. But God reminds us and each Sunday morning we sit here and we are reminded, you know what, my way is really not that good. My way is sinful. My way is ugly. My way smells. And God wants to remove that from us. Our message as a Christian, if you're in the world, guess what? You are an ambassador for the message of being born again and living in this world by faith, not by sight. So I remind you, church, live like you. If you're a Christian and you've been saved, live like it. Look like it. Act like it. Have your head up. Have a beat in your step. Remember, your father is on the throne. Uh, if, people of the world that are lost, they have reason to fear because they don't know God and Jesus like we do. Um, and so our message is, to, is one of uh, inviting them to come. And we're going to sing a, a song of encouragement. And I want to tell you very clearly, if you've never given your life to Christ, there is no better time than now. We have a remodel or no remodel. We have a baptistry ready to go over here. And we have other options even if we didn't. If someone here has never had their sins washed away in baptism, according to Scripture, and you want to do that, there's no time, there's no way, no good reason to put it off. No one in Scripture ever put off baptism. But I want you to know that if you approach God on Judgment Day at heaven and God and you've not submitted your life to Him and had your sins washed away, you cannot say you didn't know. We can't say we didn't know. Some people may be able to say that. 
But we can't say that. And so I remind you this morning about that. Um, I encourage you to do whatever you need to do to be right with God. Maybe you have a prayer on your heart or a request and you'd like us to pray for you or something. Um, if we can help you, we would ask that you come while we stand and sing. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy mind was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to Yeah. 